So that's how it is. You'd expect something huge to come from our discovery. The second revolution of astronomical science was said to take hold when we met life from the stars. We met it so close to home and this is how it ends. Not with greeting or apology but massacre. I still debate with myself if there was something else we could have done. Sometimes I wonder, had Yakov not killed that Martian, would we be in this situation? Or were these hostilities inevitable? Could this have ended with two races uniting against the sky? I'll never know. Nobody will ever know. It's too late to turn back. Not just for me, but for us. Whether or not we did the right thing is another question entirely. I'm afraid this will be my last post on this topic, so let me get everything out of the way before I start. Over the past month, I found myself involved in the discovery of life on Mars and the horrid implications of their hostility. I still don't understand the most of it. I think that's for future generations to figure out. We never deciphered any of their writing, nor did we bother to study their language. The Martians' culture is something that another person will get to understand. Their cycle of daily slaughter, the strange kindness displayed by the few, will never realize what any of it means. And it's our fault. I don't know if we did the right thing. That's for you to decide. First, a short recap. I'm a scientist working at NASA, and I've gotten to witness our several meetings with the enigmatic reptilians known as Martians. These creatures were responsible for the destruction of Spirit and Opportunity, two rovers we launched in 2004. I later found out that we'd seen them before, once with a lander, and the second time with a secret rover I named Journey. Journey's footage showed proof that the Soviets had not only landed on Mars, but apparently had landed people on the planet. My dive into that gave me a full video of most events that transpired. More worryingly, it proved a theory I had been trying to ignore. The Martians were trying to get to Earth. After I posted that, I discovered that one of our rovers, Curiosity, had been captured by the creatures, and that she may just hold the key to humanity's safety. Now, on to what's transpired since. The rover Curiosity was equipped with a hidden compartment, one that not even her engineers knew of. Inside were several toxins and explosives, all extremely powerful and tiny in scale. You see, in the event she was taken, we had a plan. By our luck, the Martians scooped her up and took her to their hive, exactly as we had planned for. Curiosity was left inside of the shrine room while the creatures awaited their ceremony. And that's when we had to decide. Curiosity was capable of wiping them out. The toxins would rapidly destroy cellular structures and all dissolve easily into water. The explosives would be laid out at strategic locations, making the hive susceptible to a remote detonation intended to ensure their fates. Twenty-five people got to decide the fate of an intelligent species. I wasn't among them, and I don't envy any of the men and women who had to make that choice. The vote was close, fourteen for to eleven against. In the end, however, they had our answer. We were to proceed with the plan. Curiosity slowly made her way down the farming sector of the hive, occasionally piercing a fruit with a lethal poison at our discretion. The Martians that did notice her paid no mind, even when she entered the central hub. From there, she took to every source of water she could find, dousing them with the toxin. One by one, each pool of water was laced with the lethal poison. When ingested, it was intended to target many systems of the body, more than necessary in case their biology is extremely different, and rapidly shut them down as painlessly as it could. In some other spots, she'd lay down one of the microscopic explosives. One of the creatures took notice of the poisoning, almost threatening to destroy the rover. Fortunately, they walked to the pond and scooped up the water with their hands, four scaly fingers ending in sharp daggers. Cusping the liquid, they slid it into their throat and swallowed. The result was unexpected. After mere seconds, the Martian's eyes expressed myriads of pain as the poison began its work. They fell over, clutching their head, shivering and spasming before their jaw unhinged in a horrifically silent scream of unbridled suffering. They kicked the pond and smashed into the floor, the jagged movements reminiscent of a stroke victim. Curiosity simply continued on, emotionless to the torture having befallen the creature. Most of the crew was emotionless too. Turning the camera back for one last glance, the Martian, having gathered the attention of others with their screaming, was bashing their skull against the rock walls, 
staining it with blood in a desperate bid to stop the pain. Finally, they fell to their knees and collapsed, dead on the cavern floor. We had worried the toxins wouldn't work. Turns out they worked too well. Regardless, she had a mission to do. We had a mission to do. Carrying on through tunnel after tunnel, she encountered resistance when what I assume is one of their priests arrived. Fury in his stare. He lunged at the rover, ready to strike her down. We couldn't react in time due to the delay, but we didn't have to. Luck remained on our side. The priest pricked himself on the grasp of curiosity, allowing the poison to enter his body. We didn't stay to watch this time. Apparently that was enough to send the majority of Martians into submissive fear of curiosity. None dared get close to her, clearing her path through the tunnels. Going deeper, she found a group of the creatures, huddled around a large blossoming flower. It resembled a rose, except it was tinted a strange hue of pink, tinted slightly gray. A small Martian, presumably a child, was sat atop. The crowd was too entranced to notice as curiosity entered the next room. This room was simply breathtaking. It opened up to a massive expanse reaching hundreds of meters in all directions. Most of the room was an underground lake, water reflecting the glittering crystals that lined the ceiling, themselves shining the reflection of curiosity's gaze back down into the water. There was no telling how deep the lake went. We couldn't risk getting her close enough to see. The best guess we have is a couple hundred meters of clear and pristinely clean water stretching down into the crust of Mars. It was most definitely their primary water source, and a decision was made to dump most of the remaining toxins into this lake, keeping a few on hand just in case. With that, Curiosity turned back through the flower room and into the central hub, where she was noticed by Leader. I knew it was him. I just knew it. Even from his faraway eyes, I could tell who it was. I think the rest of us did too. Leader stormed towards the rover in fury, lifting her up and carrying her with his strength. Behind him, many more Martians began to follow him obediently. It was time for their ritual. The grand scale of the water room was outdone by the temple, which had been substantially increased in size and grandeur since the late 90s. Hundreds to thousands of chairs were positioned across the delicate pavement, each carved to fit the stature of the Martians. Engraved into each obsidian seat were symbols much like the ones written on the prism seen before. As Leader made his way to the centerpiece, the Martians filtered in through the numerous entryways, all taking their place on the finely crafted thrones. Decorating the center shrine were distinct, human bones, all of them seared into unrecognizable patterns of glory, celebrating their deaths. Curiosity was stationed on top of a large slab to prevent her escape as Leader awaited the sacrifices. From the main entrance emerged a group of Martians wearing cloaks of tough fabric, likely salvaged from the suits brought by the Soviets. The group forced along five blindfolded individuals, only two of whom were continuing to put up any resistance. The other three marched in seeming reluctance, although knowledgeable of the inevitability of their fates. They reached the expanded altar, and one by one the tributes were forced onto the stone and had their arms and legs spread out to the sides and held down with a makeshift chain. Curiosity zoomed in on the preparation, revealing the intricacies of the ritual being performed. The priests made swift yet smooth motions, clearly accustomed to the movements involved with this process. We contemplated detonating the explosives while they worked, but decided to wait instead, keeping the small devices ready to activate at a moment's notice. This would be the last thing we'd ever see from the Martians, so I suppose we didn't want to waste it. With the tributes prepared, Leader picked up one of the larger bones resting against the altar. He showed it to the crowd to their silent yet deafening glee, then held it in front of Curiosity's camera. He grasped it tightly, glaring into the lens with burning, unending hatred, before swiftly turning around and slamming the bone into the skull of the leftmost sacrifice, cracking apart the scales to reveal the squishy interior caked with blood. Leader continued to slam the blunt end into the now dead Martian's head, flattening it and splattering himself in blood with each blow. This went on for minutes, the crowd in the distance visibly cheering him on. As before, I could make out a solitary few individuals who seemed as disgusted with the brutality as I was. Finally, Leader finished the sacrifice, resting the bone on top of the deceased's neck. He reached down to retrieve a second bone and moved to the rightmost victim one of the strugglers. Leader once again displayed the weapon to the camera, 
ensuring Curiosity had a long, intense gaze with the club. With one slash, he tore into the next target's chest, ripping open a sizable hole in the center of their abdomen. The tribute screamed and thrashed against the chains to no use as Leader struck the bone into the gaping wound and stirred it like one would prepare a soup. This was the point most of us looked away. Not me. I kept my focus on what was unfolding. A reminder to myself that we did what we had to. If they were willing to employ such torture against their own, then humans, who they hated so vehemently, they had to be stopped. Next to go was the victim in the middle. While we debated on activating the explosives and saving us the horror of witnessing the ritual, Leader started what I assume is some sort of recital or prayer. This continued for a while, the audience seen mimicking his movements and speech. We had seen enough, I heard being argued. I said nothing as the middle victim was promptly eviscerated by Leader's bladed claws. By the time he had finished, it was more than enough for the rest of us. I watched somberly as Curiosity was instructed to detonate the explosives. During the six-minute delay, Leader gestured to the remaining sacrifices, and then to Curiosity, as if to taunt her. He made no moves, simply waiting for our response. From what I can tell, it seemed that he wanted us to decide who dies next. Something we never did. Time marched on, Leader growing ever more impatient, unaware of what was to come. And then, just like that, the feed cut to white as the explosives did their work, traversing throughout the caverns as they had been placed to do. Curiosity's signal was lost as she presumably perished in the detonation. And really, that was it. Just like that, it was all over. It felt anticlimactic because it was. I can't describe the emptiness that filled me after the fact. I thought we'd see something new from them before their end. Most of all, it was the loss of curiosity that struck me. It wasn't like the other rovers, who had died in their discoveries. Curiosity may have saved the world. She did what we had to, and she'd be lost because of it. Nobody would know the truth of her demise relegated to a system failure that never happened. The world would remain blind to her sacrifice. That's what hit me hardest. After that, there wasn't much left to do. Files were expunged, records redacted or deleted outright. Video files from the past burned and left as ash. Payments made to keep people quiet, many resignations along with them, myself included. I couldn't keep working and the stars knowing all of this, then being expected to focus on the mundane. I just can't do that, as I'm sure you no doubt understand. I kept in contact with colleagues, but that was it for me. I patiently awaited the announcement of Curiosity's failure. It never happened, though. Last night I received a call from a close friend who was still working at NASA. It was about Curiosity. Just when they had prepared a cover story, she responded to a status request. By some impossible miracle, Curiosity had survived, almost entirely intact. She was in a dark, unknown cavern, and with nothing else to do, she was sent onward down the cold, lifeless path, coming into view of a light. It was an exit to the cave, leading to the surface, beams of the sun gleaming down onto her metal skin. I was relieved beyond belief to hear her survival. We don't know how it happened, nor how she ended up where she did, but nobody cared about that. Curiosity was alive and well, and could continue to explore safely without fear. In celebration, she took a few photos of the surrounding landscape. The desert red of Mars that I have come to fear and love at the same time. Dunes and hills scattered around. Slight imperfections in the crust. After all that had happened, it was beautiful. One of the photos she took was of the cavern behind her. A wide shot that appeared as a still frame from a carefully directed film. Contrasting the bright lights of the surface was the dark abyss of the cavern. I couldn't take my eyes off of this image. It astounded me in a way with the perspective of triumph it held, as curiosity proudly stood alive against all odds. There's only one thing that soured this moment. It was the dozens of crimson dots staring from the darkness.